This is an optional video about unsupervised learning, and in particular, about different types of clustering. So in the last couple of videos, we've been looking at documents, at features of documents, and how we can use those features to cluster documents together. We've been looking at documents that can be very short, like descriptions of sushi in Hanover, some longer ones, like Shakespeare plays, but in all cases, we've uh, given the input to the computer, and all we've given the computer is a way to measure distance between documents, which is the features. We give it a measure to a way to measure distance, and then told it to try to find which documents were more similar, and which documents were more dissimilar. And doing that, the computer can find clusters of similar data points. We could do this with um, web pages, for example. We could do this with entire books. We could even do this with entire languages. If we had features like the similarity of words across languages, we could find that some languages are more closely related, like French and Spanish, for example, and some languages are related, but more distantly so, like Spanish and Hindi, or English and Hindi. That's on the Indo-European side, which is our language family. There's many other language families. For example, the Austronesian one includes languages like Hawaiian, Samoan, and Tagalog from the Philippines. As you can see, those languages are related, but Hawaiian and Samoan are more closely related because their features, their words, are more similar than the words between Hawaiian and Tagalog, for example. So in all these cases, we need to figure out how to provide features, how to calculate similarity, and how to, um, what kind of clusters are we expecting to find? Are we expecting to find many? Are they gonna be well distinguishable and separated? These are questions that we need to ask ourselves when we try to perform unsupervised learning in general and clustering in particular. Are our clusters well separated so that the computer can clearly find them? Or maybe they overlap. There's some regions where it's difficult to determine whether something belongs to cluster A or to cluster B. How many features are we going to feed into the unsupervised learning system? If we give it a thousand features, the data might be very rich, but the computer might have a very hard time finding um, distinct features in the data. So we need to be smart about how, what kind of features we are going to feed it. Also, we're gonna to need to figure out how to measure distances between two objects, how to figure out if they're similar or not. We've been using a kind of linear distance where we measure the, the similarity between two objects with a straight line in three-dimensional space, for example. In, um, the next video, we're going to look at uh, trajectories that are not straight lines, for example, that are um, curves across spheres. In this video, we're going to focus on the first two questions. What happens if our clusters overlap? And what happens if we have many dimensions? How do we reduce those dimensions to the ones that we really need? Let's start with the overlap. We looked at an algorithm called k-means, which performs really well when the clusters are separate. When we have the situation like the one we have here, there's three separate clusters, but all of the data points are like in their own region of space. There's no case where, for example, one dot from one of the clusters is intermixed with a dot from the other region. Also, if we place a center in each of the clusters, it's very obvious that the center is going to be very close to, um, the, to all the data points in that cluster and very far away from data points in other clusters. But what would happen if we had an overlap? For example, the distributions that we have here. Here we have one dimension. It's just the position across this x-axis. And we have potentially two clusters, the red dots and the blue dots. The red dots have their center 
probably around three somewhere over there because that's where the most red dots are and the blue dots have their center around either five or seven somewhere over there because that's where we find the most blue dots so clearly there's there's two things here and there could be two clusters but look at the region around four there's a region there where blue and red dots intermingle so it's not easy to set up a single border between them that clearly separates the blue dots from the red dots. In this case, k-means is going to have problems separating uh, these two clusters. But that's okay. Maybe we don't need some sort of edge in between them. What we need to figure out is the probability of a dot being blue or a dot being red. There is an algorithm called expectation maximization that does exactly this. Here we have the same dots, but all of them are colored purple to reflect the fact that when the computer gets the dots, it doesn't know which one switch. And we start uh, the same way we did with K means. We drop two centers at random, wherever. And as you can see, the centers here are not very good. One of them landed at around one, the center for the putative red cluster and the center for the possible blue cluster landed around nine somewhere over there they don't really match any of the data points the next thing you do is calculate the probability of a dot belonging to a certain cluster let's focus on the blue cluster so the blue cluster has um, a pro uh, we have the center of the blue cluster at around nine and we put it there at random and then we project a probability distribution around it something like a normal um, curve where it goes up around the center and then it drops it looks like a little bell curve when we draw that distribution uh, we have the maximum of that probability distribution at the center and then we have uh, distribution probabilities for other parts of the axis. For example, the dots in eight have a very high probability of belonging to the blue cluster because the, the curve is very high in that region. The dots around seven also have a fairly high probability of belonging to the blue cluster. Notice that it has a maximum there and then it descends. So by the time it reaches two, for example, it's zero completely zero so a dot at around two for example or one has a very low probability of belonging to the blue cluster so this is the expectation phase the next thing we do is try to maximize the probability of finding the actual center of the cluster we do this as follows we have the old center which for the blue is around nine. And then we calculate the distance between that old center and the every, every other data point, the points in eight, the point in six, the points in two. But we multiply each of those distances by their probability. So for example, a dot in eight is gonna have a very high probability. So the multiplication is going to give you a higher result because it's um, gonna have a higher number. And this dot will therefore make a high contribution towards finding the average position of the new center. On the other hand, we also calculate the contribution of a dot around two. But because the distance for that dot is gonna be multiplied by a number that is very close to zero, that dot is gonna make a, make a very small contribution towards the new center of the blue distribution. So the dots around eight are gonna have a very high contribution. The dots around two are gonna have a very low contribution. In doing so, we move the old center onto this new position, and then we try again and again, like we did with the k-means. Notice that what we did was take the points and then calculate the probability that they belonged to a certain cluster. We don't really have a strong edge in between them. The figure shown here shows 
five iterations of this process. And as you can see, the center does seem to approach the apparent centers of the red dots and the blue dots. There are also some areas where it is difficult to tell whether a dot belongs to the reds or the blues. For example, if a dot is around five, both distributions have about the same probability. So we're not really sure what would happen to a dot there. But that's okay. As we know, learning algorithms do not have to be perfect for them to work well. So this is a solution in case our clusters have high degrees of overlap. We don't calculate the distance uh, on its own. We calculate the distance and then we compensate with the probability. And this algorithm is called expectation maximization. Let's take a brief look at uh, the second problem, having many dimensions. We looked at descriptions of documents that had three dimensions, for example, having sushi, Hanover, and origami. But what if our description had 300 dimensions? So the presence or absence of 300 words. We would then need to calculate distances and clusters across 300 dimensional space. And it might be very difficult to calculate cohesive um, clusters in this kind of high dimensionality. We probably need to reduce the dimensions to figure out which dimensions are not contributing a lot so that we can simplify our problem. One way to do this would be to figure out dimensions or features that have no variance. For example, where the values are the same or nearly the same for every document. We've already seen one example of this. In our description of Shakespeare documents, the word good has the same TF IDF value for every document. It's always zero because it appears in every single one of them. So one thing we could do would be just eliminate that feature because it has no variance. As a matter of fact, it's always the same, zero. And it's therefore not contributing much to our analysis of the documents. There's many other ways to reduce dimensionality. One um, popular approach is called principal component analysis. And let's imagine the following. Let's say I have a plane like this in three-dimensional space. So our axis system starts somewhere around here. And in order for me to describe the points along this plane, I need three dimensions, x, y, z for one edge of my plane, x, y, z for another edge of my plane. So the description of this object is three-dimensional. However, maybe I could squash the three dimensions into two dimensions by describing the dots by their position along an imaginary plane that I can draw here and here. If I rotated this plane, so that it looked like this. It would now have two dimensions. One dimension would, would be this one, one dimension would be the other one. And I could describe the dots according to the positions in the new dimensions that I drew. So I had a three-dimensional object, but with the right rotation, I can make it look like a two-dimensional object. These new axes that explain the variation of the dots are going to be called principal components. And this technique is called principal component analysis. So if we have the object like this, the greatest variation would be that sometimes the dots are here, 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 here. They go upwards and downwards. So we're going to draw our new principal component to describe this source of variation. There's another variation where the dots are later lateral to that line. So that's also going to describe some variation. And that's how we're going to draw our second principal component. When we rotate them, this will describe the variation going up and down, and this will describe the lateral variation. This is another visualization of the exact same thing. Imagine you have not a, uh, something that looks like a CD or like a tortilla in looking like this. Likewise, the dots are along this three-dimensional object, but if we rotate it in the right way, 
it would look two dimensional. And now you could describe the positions along that CD or that tortilla uh, according to this new two dimensional system. Each of those dimensions would be a principal component. And it is a good way to reduce dimensionality. You could reduce hundreds of dimensions to potentially two or three dimensions. This is a concrete example with a genetic expression. For example, we have three dimensions of the occurrence of certain genes. And likewise, it's an object that looks like a plane. So when we rotate it, we have the positions of the dots along our rotated principal components one and two. So we've simplified a three-dimensional problem to a two-dimensional problem. And it makes it easier for clusters to emerge in our data because we've eliminated dimensions where there wasn't a lot of variance. And now we have the dimensions with the most variance. This is a partial summary of what we have so far. There's many algorithms for unsupervised learning and clustering. And we were, we're only going to see very few examples. We're, we've looked at k-means, which is very good when clusters are easy to separate. It just drifts around the space looking for places where you can anchor a cluster. Sometimes the clusters are going to overlap in which case we're going to need probabilistic algorithms like expectation maximization. It drifts around space, but then it draw, doesn't draw a hard border. It draws a probability distribution of a certain dot belonging to a cluster. We also have the problem of dimensionality, where it might be difficult for a program to find clusters if there's too many dimensions. There's algorithms to reduce dimensionality. Some of them are linear, like PCA. So if you remember what we did with the principal component analysis, we made new axes that looked like lines. And when we rotate it, they are straight lines. In the next video, we're going to look at nonlinear dimensionality reduction and at some popular algorithms to turn, for example, 300 dimensional objects into two dimensional objects.